Thank you so much for that introduction, my friends, and thank you to Assisi for having me. I, I think this is such a, a great discussion. We're going to have some fun, too, because if, like I said, if you may or may not know me, I do love to laugh, and I know we're going to be talking about, you know, something that's very common in practice that I cannot wait to share with you, some of these great modalities that you may or might, may not know. And I just love the title, too, by the way, because Pain, Pain, Go Away, it couldn't come at a better time up here in New Jersey. It is raining cats and dogs. You have cats to be kidding me. So rain, rain, go away, pain, pain, go away. And, um, you know, this is something that obviously resonates with a lot of us veterinarians, veterinary technicians and professionals. So let's get into it. We have a lot to chat about. And um, I have a, a, a question first that I want to ask my friends, if you agree or disagree with this statement, because I think there's, there is this disconnect. I, in my experience as a general practitioner, working almost 20 years now in practice and uh, now in ER, I feel like there is often a disconnect between pain perception from veterinarian or veterinary technician or receptionist and pet parent. Comment in the chat box if you could, or if you, uh, or nod with me that if you agree or disagree with this statement, because I do feel that there is a little bit of, of that disparity, if you will. And I think the conversation can happen as early as a phone call too. When, you know, the pet parent is making the phone call and they're just here for their checkup and, you know, she's doing some limping, but she's always been that way. It's always been that way. Oh, we see, I have the Q&A box. I actually can see questions that come in. And so this is exciting now. Let me see if I can actually manage this too. Now, oh, this good. Is, you can see it. Okay, great. I see, yeah, the Q&A. I think I would have to like close out my screen for it, I believe, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, so you know, like it starts with a phone call, right? They'll say, you know, uh, Molly's due for her rabies vaccine and just want to make a, a, a an exam. And oh yeah, by the way, she is limping, but like, she's always been like that. She's just getting old, you know? And so there is that kind of disconnect. And usually an astute receptionist or client service representative would say, wait, I think we should have a conversation about this with Dr. Crispin because this might be an issue, which usually it is. And we just have to kind of get into the nuts and bolts about it a little bit further. And so, you know, oftentimes pain is perceived as more of a behavioral issue. Comment in the chat box. Give me a yes or no if you believe in that too. Do you think that pain is sometimes perceived as a behavioral issue? And sometimes it might be our due diligence as veterinary professionals to stop right there and have some sort of an educational component associated with it. So good. I see some yeses coming in. So yeah, I really do feel like that's really what um, how it begins. And here are some things that you may hear about, whether it be from um, any veterinary profession in your hospital, like difficulties getting into the litter box. I mean, now we're in a virtual space. And when I do telemedicine consults and I'll watch on camera, I'll say, Dad, do me a favor. Let me let me see if you could just like follow her around. I just want to see how he goes into the litter box. And sure, sure enough, he says, well, he just struggles going into that lip of the litter box and everything. I said, maybe that explains why we're having number one, number two problems, inappropriate elimination, because his hip hurts or he's, an arth he's arthritic, he's getting older. So we need to address those issues because we're seeing secondary issues that are happening. So do you see that too in practice? Are you, do you experience cats that have maybe inappropriate elimination problems when maybe it's associated with pain and we're not addressing the underlying cause? Do you, have, do you see that? What about going up and down the stairs? We're in curbside and I can't begin to tell you how many times that I have seen dogs that have come out of the car for curbside and you know, Dogs, obviously, as we know, that they bear more weight on their thoracic limbs than they do on their pelvic limbs. So when they go down, sometimes you see, oof, you know, they really take that solid hit. And she's like, oh, it's okay. Come on, you know, shake it off. You're okay. Mm, are you? I don't think you're okay. So I would even stop. I said, mom, do me a favor. I want to show you something. Did you see what she just did? She's like, oh, Dr. Kristen, she's been doing that for years. But maybe we can address that issue. You know, like you tell me, do you think mom that that's pain or is that just the way she is? She's like, oh, she's been always like that. Let's talk about this. I said, let's talk about that. So, you know, maybe we should talk about ramps, multimodal therapies that we're going to talk about. How about decreased playtime and limping overall too? Some, I, I, I'm I, sure you all agree with me. There, we, there will be instances that pet parents will say, it's always been like that. She's always been limping a little bit on the lear, the left pelvic limb or the right front paw. Like she's has a congenital anomaly or genetic issue with her feet or whatever. Maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. And we're not really addressing that those issues there too. So, you know, those are some things that we can easily see. Inappetence, you know, 
of course, there's so, you know, for inappetence to occur, but we want to make sure that they're comfortable too, because inappetence can be a huge sign of pain. Or I'll get phone calls that's like, you know, she's just getting old. I think she's got dementia because she's restless at night. Maybe she's sleeping a half hour. She's got her nights and days confused, or, you know, he's just having a hard time sleeping through the night. To me, that's a big red flag. I'm sure it is for you as veterinary professionals as well. So, you know, the these conversations not only start with just us, it also starts with the receptionist, the veterinary technician and assistants that you see, the veterinarian and any staff member that's astute to these things. So that's why I always wanna back that up a little bit because you certainly can have these issues that you see and you just, we may not be, we might be overlooking it. And so, you know, for example, this famous quote, doc, she's still eating and drinking just fine. I'm so glad she's comfortable, not in any pain. She's just getting old. Comment in the chat box. Do you see that often? Do you hear this often? And are you like, huh? You know, like my dog is just getting old or my cat is just getting old. Age is a disease since when? You know, since when is age is a disease? So, you know, there are so many things that have come out. Oh, I see. So thank you for sharing these. Yes. Um, there are so many things that have been coming out these days that we just need to address. Sometimes we just don't know and we have to educate them a little bit. Maybe they're reluctant to get up in the morning and they think that that's okay. So let's talk about, I want to really kind of break down the nuts and bolts and really talk about the physical exam because that is part of our modality with how we go about treating these things. And of course, just you may or may not know a little fun fact about me. I'm a doxaholic. Yes, I'm proud to admit it. I mean, like it gets to the extent where, I don't know if you can see behind me, I didn't know that Pablo Picasso, by the way, had a dachshund until pet owners got me the drawings behind me. I have a, a dachshund over my other shoulder over here. I have a dachshund that's on a bicycle. And you know what that means? It's doxycycling is what it is. <laughs> and of course, look, if you can see me, I have the slinky dog. You know, so clients get me so many things. So anyway, this is why pain is very, very near and dear to me, as you probably know what I'm going to talk about in a moment. You can see that I use this model a lot. As you can tell, we talk about the nucleus propulsus and annulus fibrosis often. So <laughs> it's a great model for you. So for me to demonstrate that. Anyway, so let's talk about the physical exam. Observations from the entire hospital team, right? Everyone should be looking at. Have a Zoom meeting with your team. Talk about gait analysis. Is it neurologic? Is it orthopedic? But overall, are they in pain? Are they uncomfortable? We as professional veterinarians could probably help decipher orthopedic disease from neurologic disease, but I want my team to make sure we understand what pain modalities look like, my friends. And that is something that everyone wants to learn about. We want to be more proactive than reactive. And that's why we have these great modalities that are here. So gate analysis, have the conversation with your receptionists and technicians, or what I like to call if you don't have it. By the way, comment in the chat box. Do you have what I call techceptionists? Are they technicians and receptionists? Are they receptionists and technicians? Just a fun fact, I feel like it's a really great tool to use. Everybody's cross-trainable. Nobody's above everything. Everybody wants to learn. They can invoice clients out. They can take exam histories. They can understand gate analysis like this. They feel valued. So if you don't use the word techceptionist, if there's one thing that you're gonna get out of the first part of this, you can write in the tech, write in the tech, uh, the chat box right now, techceptionist, because it's going to help you remember that if you don't do it, okay? Because this is the teacher of me, as you can tell, I'm a teacher, and I tell my students, I want you to write it in the chat box because now you know it's going to work. <laughs> so I'm teaching you all things. So proprioceptive deficits, we all know about those, right? We know about proprioception deficits in terms of neurologic disease. So, but. Pet parent, oh, thank you, I see somebody writing it in. Thank you so much. So proprioceptive deficits are important because it helps understand underlying neurologic disease. How about nail wear, right? German shepherds, if they have degenerative myelopathy, if there's underlying orthopedic lameness issues, ACLs, MPLs, whatever it is, they can have these underlying problems. So the other thing is I really like to take a careful, maybe th this is not a control freak in me because I get told doctors being a control freak, you're watching the dogs like come in and out of the hospital. I said, because it's given me an idea how their gait is going to be. Of course, it depends on the size of the animal, but like my medium to large breed dogs, I do like to see them come in. And you know what? It's just good client service. When things return to normal, I used to greet them in the hallway. Come on in, good to see you. But at the corner of my eye, I'm actually studying their gait to make sure that they look comfortable. If anything's off, are we doing the head bob? You know, are we holding an elbow up? Are we splay legged in the back? Are we dropped? Are we having more of a plantigrade stance? And you know, when I'm doing the physical exam, I'm also massaging them, just getting to know them, but I'm also looking at them at the same time. So the slow walk from curbside is a good indication for me too. 
How about give me the number? Give me the number one in the chat box if you agree that you hear difficulty squatting for number one and two. Do you ask that question? Give me the number one, yes. Number two, no, in the chat box. As you can tell, I like to interact with my audiences, so I keep you going here. Give me the number one if this is something that you include in your physical exam or your history taking. And number two, if this is something that you know what I really should do more of this because you should ask them or ask your tech exceptions about this. Are they having a hard time squatting? Cats are having a hard time squatting because, you know, listen, I'll never forget in my, my anatomy class at Iowa State, I had to write down my one, it was one exam, it was my one question for an exam, tell me all the muscles and nerves that are innervated to do uh, number one and number two and a male dog and a female dog. And I was like, oh my God, Kelly Clarkson, that's a lot of muscles that I have to do, right? <laughs> you don't realize it. And so there's a lot of nerve interaction that happens there. So if you see them, you know, oh, this hurts. Oh, you know, they don't maybe necessarily have tenismus or strenuria. They're just have, un they have underlying pain that we need to recognize. So, you know, I want to bring that to your attention. Okay, my friends. So I want to share some modalities with you. So being the chief veterinary officer here at Fetch DVM 360, I have this wonderful honor and privilege of chatting and receiving some great tools to utilize in practice and see what my thoughts are on them. Okay, so by no means am I, you know, endorsing one things, but if I'm, if I'm showing you these slides, my friends, that means this is something to you should really keep under your radar. Not everything that you're going to see over the next several slides are things that you're going to have in practice, but I want you to file these things away. And this is one that you should keep under your radar. Give me the number one, if you heard of pain trace before yet, have you heard of this before? Do you know that there is a way of identifying pain in dogs, cats, horses, sheep, goats, food animals. Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time because this is a big deal that is heavily researched by our friends at Pain Trace or BioTrace It by veterinarians. So dogs, cats, pigs, horse, sheep, cattle, the way we humanely treat our animals for food animal production, the way we treat our horses and identifying laminitis, and the way we understand pain in general in our companion animals. This is a game changer, my friends. Okay, so what this is, is there's two leads that go on the left and the right thoracic cavity. It's like an ECG lead, but it's not an ECG, okay? And so what it is, it's a wearable monitor that measures both acute and chronic pain. And I'm gonna say that one more time. This measures both acute and chronic pain. Give me the number one, if you find that interesting. Number two, if you don't really care. But number one, if you find that interested. And number two is like, I probably would, don't know what this means. Because I like to know, oh good. So some of you are really interested in that because that's excellent. It just helps me understand like, okay, this is cool stuff because I think it's fascinating too. And so the company sent me this device to try on my dogs and to try and practice. And so what it does is it's measuring real time pain levels that are acquired using skin mounted sensors. So you have to shave the animal left and right side, just like you're doing an ECG, okay? So small little patches that process direct pain biosignals generated by the nervous system. So it's researched in canine, equine, bovine, and human patients proving the ability of pain trace to quantify pain. Prep time's about five minutes for it, okay? So it doesn't take long. And what I'm wanting you to think about is look at this in terms of, you know, let's face it, what I'm gonna be showing you has, you're never gonna see a single pill on these slides, okay? Now, trust me, gabapentin, you know, all the pain medications, anti-inflammatories, they all have their place, do not get me wrong. This is a conversation of adding modalities. And I want you to think about this too, my friends, as we're going into a new generation of veterinary medicine, how do we quantify data? How do we keep our patients comfortable? And how can we maintain revenue in our hospitals? This is a way of maintaining and keeping streamlining um, management of pain in our patients, okay? Who would not want to pay a little upcharge to know that your animals are in pain? If they could talk to, and I said this to mom and dad, like in an exam room once, I said, if, if she could talk to me right now, I think this is how we do it. I think this is how we're gonna get to know if they're in pain. So little to no minute, so about five minutes of prep time. And this is what it looks like. So they send you a, um, an iPad, all right? And they walk you through it too. They go over all the training education. They would have like a lunch and learn with your staff. So you're all familiar because your technicians can do this too. Your uh, receptionists, receptionists can do this. So you have um, 
an X axis and a Y axis is going to detect if there's positive pain or negative or deep pain. So the top axis is no pain, okay? But the bottom axis is where you're going to see sizable and noticeable pain. So for example, I put this on myself and I put a chair on my foot and I was pressing, okay? And it hurts, obviously. I'm not a psychopath, but I wanted to see. And sure enough, the greater, the firmer I was pressing, I like, look at this, son of a gun. Like it was getting really, really red down deep, letting you know acute pain. So picture deep red spikes for your chronic arthritis, your chronic cancer, dental disease, okay? So this really helps engage that conversation. It narrows that gap that can uh, exist between the pet parent's perception of pain versus our perception of pain in our patients. So this is another ex extra tool that you can add to your arsenal, okay? So oh, let me go back one, hold on one second. Let me just go back, I'm trying to move my, um, my box here, okay. So he, this is from the website from the company, but I wanted to show this case because I think it's a good example. So left forelimb pain during a veterinary exam of the fifth digit non-union. So this was a six-year-old greyhound presented with an inflamed digit of the left forelimb. Dog was found to be non-responsive to the veterinary exam and appeared to be masking pain. Greyhounds, as you know, give me the number one, by the way, total side note, number one, have you ever had a grand greyhound that had like the biggest lacerations and they're like, hey, what's going on? No, no, I'm like, where's the party at? Woohoo! And you're like, oh my God, you know, like there's a huge laceration and they're just like doing their thing because some dogs are so stoic at masking their pain. So listen to this. So pain trace was utilized and it became evident pain was experienced upon weight bearing on the affected left foot. Subsequent radiographs confirmed a fractured non-union. So non-union fracture that was there. Okay. So the dog returned for a follow-up visit five days post-op fifth digit amputation with the fracture of the non-union and affected left forelimb. Pain was managed with gabapentin, codeine, meloxicam or medicam. So that's great, right? Nice multimodal approach there. From the pain trace signal, the post-op follows appears to represent managed acute pain based on the absence of any significant negative pain trace signal deflections. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to show you what it looks like. So remember, those spikes are deflections that you're going to see. So the overall pain trace baseline is more negatively potential. My gosh, remember thinking of like action potentials? That's what it reminds me of, right? Denoting an increase overall or chronic mild pain levels. So veterinary exam also confirmed the absence of acute pain. So look at this. So on the left here, you see the right forelimb, okay? So the left forelimb is where we had some issues. So left forelimb exam, we had a little bit of a spike that was going on. Left forelimb down, shift weight forward to increase pressure on the forelimbs. Look at this, noted pain when the left forefoot weight bears when there was a fracture. Ow, that hurts, look how deep, okay? Left shoulder palpation, there was some pain there. Right shoulder for compensating for the left. Walking hurt on the far right that you could see. So these gives you a little bit of ideas on the Y axis versus the X axis is the number of times. So this was on for about 20 minutes, just so you have an idea, okay? So this gives you a degree of the severity of pain on the Y axis that you see, okay? So five days post exam, uh, this is exam while the dog was laying down. So this was over the course of looks like eight minutes. And so the pain trace was put on. They palpated the incision for amputation, uh, examined the left shoulder, they stood up, and then the dog was feeling much better. Weight bearing, weight bearing, remove the sensors off. So the pain was noticeably different, which is fantastic. Okay, so other indications for pain trace. I want you to think of your pre and post-op surgeries, your ACLs, your cystotomies, your dentals. Um, think of your chronic pain, such as cancer, osteoarthritis. Nowadays, palliative medicine is huge, huge right now. Think of like your house calls that you want to do and notice if it is it time, Dr. Christman, to put my animal down. This could be a good tool to use to show, you know, to make that decision. There's other factors, of course, that come into play, as you and I know. But think about that. What are your thoughts on this? Comment in the chat box. I'd like to hear your thoughts too, because you're a general practitioner just like me. I would love to see what your thoughts are too. Equine medicine and also in food medicine. So I think that has a place for it. Okay. The other modality that I want to share with you for the physical exam is thermal imaging. Thermal imaging. So remember... Uh, you know, not that long ago, and it's still happening around the country, of course, is temperature checks. So what you see on the right, of course, you know, I just came back from uh, Disney, and fortunately, they don't have any more because I was over there last year, 
and they did have the thermal screenings and all that that you had to go through, but now you don't. But you know, basically, this is the same company that does this also in our space now too, because we're looking for obviously heat, redness, swelling, or re re heat, redness. What does that remind you of? Inflammation, also pain. So now they have it in the veterinary space. So I don't know if you know this. Give me the number one if you know that this exists. The number two if you had no idea or something that you would look, in, look into um, for your clinic. But they have veterinary thermography. So it uses a camera. Oh, good. I see some that. Okay, excellent. So it uses a camera to measure a patient's body surface temperatures. So the veterinary specific software, remember, this is veterinary specific software. So if you look on the left, this is from the web, the company's website as well. It shows that there's redness inflammation showing you something's going on in that left thoracic area too. So thermal images are used to colors to represent the body surface temperatures of the animal, provides a physiological map of the patient, allows veterinarians to see the unseen. So again, another tool that we can add to our arsenal in understanding pain. Another tool that we can help narrow that gap of disconnect with our pet parents. Another tool that is a service item that we can charge for appropriately to help make better decisions. How exciting is this? This is what I love about our profession so damn much. I can't begin to tell you the amount of evolution that happens with the changing medicine. This is what makes it exciting to be a veterinarian and professional by utilizing all these wonderful tools. So Digitherm has a software system with easy integration. It's a great tool, physical exam for both acute and chronic pain and inflammation too. So, you know, again, like if you want to run the scan over them to look at arthritis, uh, it'll show redness or whatever. If you want to run the tool over their mouth, dental pain, you know, back pain, those kinds of areas, cervical, thoracic, lumbar regions. Yeah, you know, like go for it. So, you know, definitely look into that too. Again, these are just options that I want to bring to your, uh, keep under your radar because again, I feel like I wouldn't be doing you any service if I didn't bring to the table all these wonderful tools and conversations that I have had over the past year and a half here at Fetch DVM 360. And this is one of those. Okay, now I know I wanna bring these back to your attention too because I wanna ask you, do you use a pain score in your patients? We know about body condition score, right? Do you have this famous one, the Colorado State um, University Veterinary Medical Center's acute pain score scale? Because I think this is something that's great. It's a great teaching tool for your um, for your staff, for your veterinary technicians. I think it's um, very, very useful for those kinds of situations too. That way you can kind of have more of an understanding. So, you know, of course, this is a scale of one to four. And then um, it talks about their psychological and behavioral issues. Oh, good. I see a, a couple of you have been using it too. And then response to palpation and body tensing. So again, you can have these posted in the waiting rooms once things are cut. I know like some of these hospitals are opening up, which is great for exam rooms. Another great tool. You can make this as a PDF. You could do a video about this on your hospital website or Facebook, Instagram. Those of you that know me know I love social media. Talk to me offline about it. I'd be more than happy to help you um, come, you know, think outside the litter box is what I like to say. But this is a tool that pet parents yearn for because if you do telemedicine, you can have this with them and say, mom, this, I'll give you a perfect sound bite. Dad, do me a favor. I want you to, I'm gonna print off something from our website. I want you to have this on tool. So when we talk in a couple of minutes, I want us to talk about this pain score. And I want you to tell me what you think Molly's pain score is. And I'm gonna tell you when you show me walking her around her kitchen. And I want you to go up the stairs for me. Do me a favor, bring her up the stairs, bring her down the stairs. And what do you think her pain score is? And usually he's like, ah, it's hard to tell, doc. It's like somewhere between a two and a three. Like, see how she's really hunched over when she's going up the stairs? It's like, yes, yes, I do see it. I'm glad you see what I see. And I agree with you. I would put her somewhere between a two and a three. Pet parents don't want you to argue with them. They want to know, but they also want to feel empowered. So you won't, you don't want to discourage their knowledge. Even if he said it's a zero, I appreciate where you're coming from, dad. But let me show you why I think it's at a three. Let me show you why. Okay, because these are conversations that we should be having. So you put this in the chart, you document it, you make your treatment plan accordingly, you do whatever you need. But the uh, pain score is fantastic. Again, I'm all about bringing in, narrowing that, that bridge or disconnect. I like to elicit the pet parent's perspective always. It's always important to do it. And I think it's necessary. Okay, my friends, I need you to comment in the chat box as well. As well. Do you use the feline grimace scale? Have you heard of the feline grimace scale? 
Have you heard of it? I'm going to pause for a moment because I really want to make sure that if not, I want you to make sure you're taking advantage of this, my friends, because you need to either screenshot this. I can. The website is over there on the bottom left there that you can get this from. Uh, a good friend of mine, veterinarian, and her husband out of Canada, vet, veterinary school, created this. Did so much research on it. So I want to give them a shout out for it because it's just wonderful and a great, great tool as we're going into understanding feline medicine and behavior much, much more. And, you know, a good announcement too is there's a lot more feline pain modalities that are in the pipeline the only way we're going to be able to properly diagnose it is understanding it so the feline grimace scale is fantastic the reason why i'm a huge fan of it because i learned i didn't learn this in vet school i'll tell you that i learned this about two years ago when it was about to happen and um you know they were teaching me these things i want to bring your attention to which i just find so fascinating this is why again i, I get so pumped and jazzed about our profession look at the whiskers did anybody, now I'm not a cat parent, but I love cats and working in shelter medicine, when I'm going through and checking out the cats, making sure they're comfortable. Now I look at their whiskers and their ears more than ever, because it gives me an idea. Are their ears facing forward? Are their ears slightly pulled back a little bit? Are their ears really flattened and rotated outward? Like I think of like the blocked cat cat, the cat that needs to be deobstipated, the cat that me has like serious stomatitis, dental disease, maybe Khaleesi virus that I see in shelter medicines or rhinotracheitis. Um, you know, then we have like maybe the dietary indiscretions, maybe they have some chronic kidney failure, and they're feeling like at a at a one, you know, so and you know this in conjunction with the skin tenting, the physical exam, you know the eye exam, all those different things. This gives you a good idea. Like I love the picture on the left because this kitty reminds me, like, hey, where's the party at? I'm ready to party. <laughs> this cat just cracks me up. But like that's that cat to me looks like he's engaged. Like he wants me to throw the feather around. He's ready to go. Number one is like, you know what? Call me in seven days. Get me on some meds, docs, and maybe I'll play. Number number two is like, listen, no, hell to the no. I ain't ready. I hurt. I need pain, uh, pain management. So I think this is a great tool. Are you using this in practice? Do you think this is a value? Comment in the chat box. I'd like to hear your thoughts about this because Again, your technicians will eat this up like candy if you're not doing it. This is great. Your clients will seriously eat this up. If you're having feline-friendly hours, if you're a cat-only clinic, um, hang these posters up, showcase this, do a video about this, show them what a, um, a zero, one, and two looks like. You know, Ask the clients, comment in the chat box down below, what do you think your cat is tonight? What do you think your cat looks like tomorrow? Because again, you're getting that audience engagement, you're connecting to your community. These are very important things, mildly subjective, but heavily, heavily scientific. So, oh good, I, I love the comments coming in, so thank you, I'm so glad. Now, this is something that I don't personally use, but I do want to keep this under your radar, too, because this is a very good fear-free module, too, for understanding feline pain. It's the Feline Musculoskeletal Pain Index, the FMPI, and painfreecats.org is where it's at. If you want to take a screenshot of that or a picture of it, you can see um, what, more information about it, too. And this gives you a lot more information on metrology. So it's a clinical metrology in instrument, scoring the degree to which a cat is suffering pain associated with chronic musculoskeletal disorders. So measures the relevant clinical features of mobility, gait, disposition, things like that. Um, it's developed by NC State. We got to give a shout out to anybody from NCC, College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, it's the only clinically validated instrument for diagnosing, monitoring, feeling chronic pain arising from degenerative joint disorders. So, and it's a question that may be administered by vet professionals and cat parents too. And so it's a sum of this sco uh, scored observations and it measures the degree of which the cat suffers from pain associated with long-term DJD, for instance, or neuromuscular orthopedic conditions. Okay, so this is another thing, if you haven't done it, especially to my cat veterinarians out there, or you wanna level up even more on feline met, uh, medicine and pain, because you, know, you and I both know they're so darn good and stoic at masking pain. Um, this is another great method. Okay. I threw this in here because I got to give a shout out because well, Dr. Ken Lambrecht, if you don't know him from uh, Wisconsin, fantastic veterinarian. He's he's created and he's about to launch this app in September. It's out now, but he's going to be going uh, full force in September. Um, it's called Healthy Pet Connect. Now, do not, do not forget about obesity leading to pain, okay? And we know it. We know that obesity is a disease. We know and we treat it like no other. Okay. And so I always want to throw in a little bit because I'm a little bit passionate about nutrition. And so 
you know, I think that having a diary for pet parents now more so than ever, let me tell you something, my friends, I'm on TikTok, Dr. Adam Crispin 52, follow me on TikTok. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because I have over 500,000 followers on TikTok. They're all pet parents. They are all pet parents. And when I go live on TikTok, I have about 5,000, you know, parents, pet parents that are in the room. We chat about this. The number one thing is what you see here. How can I get weight off my dog and cat in a healthy way? So this Healthy Pet Connect is going to be an area that you can interact with a veterinarian to help safely look at, or decrease um, obesity or get the weight off of them, but also maintain their weight nicely too. So it's customizable measuring weighing system. Their body condition score is one to nine. I know sometimes some of us do the one to five, but I think it's a great shout out. I wanted to throw that in there too. Dr. Kristen Kirkby Shaw, good friend of mine. If you don't know her, you need to. She's wonderful. She's double boarded, of course, and uh, orthopedic surgery, as well as pain management. And she has this wonderful survey on her website, caninearthritis.org. Um, and I want to ask my friends in the audience too, how many of you use a survey? Yes or no, right? Yes or no, if you provide a survey for pain in dogs and cats, do you provide and offer a survey to your um, pet parents? Do you have it on a website? Do you have it on social media? Do you have it as a questionnaire? Um, is it part of like your senior at seven um, modality method? Do you not have one? Um, because it, it, it is something to, to be mindful of. Now, listen, I know we're so busy. Oh my gosh, my friends, aren't we? What happened? <laughs> what happened to us? We're, we're so popular, this profession, you know? So I see some of us use it, some of us don't. Um, you know, we're, we're such a popular profession. So you're probably thinking, Dr. Christman, I'm lucky like I can have a bio break in between appointments right now, let alone having them ask like 20,000 questions. That's okay. Maybe you, should, you could do like a survey monkey, send something out to your clients just to see, you know, survey them. And you can do a general one. Or you can link this in to a visit, you know, before, know before you go. So they can ask this and you can populate this on like a, a website or that's easy for them to click on, on an app. Um, you can reach out to me about all those things too, because I know how to do those. But if you wanted to do it just as a regular paper, you could do that as well. I mean, listen, some of them are curbside, give them something to do while they're waiting. You know, you can do your exam, kind of check back and have this conversation with them. Your basic questions. My dog is looking at one area obsessively. Don't you hear that all the time? Like the, to, I don't know why I'm picking the chocolate lab, but you probably know what I'm going to say. The chocolate lab and the lick granulomas. What is that? Right? <laughs> but it's a thing. So they're thinking that it's a lick granuloma, but they may not necessarily know that that's pain associated with like their carpus or the elbow hygromas, for example, and the Great Dane. Um, my dog sleeps more. My dog's restless at night. Like the list goes on of all these different things that you see here, limping and not putting weight on a leg. Yes or no, my dog can't seem to get comfortable. Oh, that's a good one. My dog struggles to go up or downstairs. My dog has trouble um, getting up from lying down. Yes, you know, yes, it's like, you know, it'll be interesting because what this is doing is this is holding what we call pet parent accountability. You may not know it until the questions and the words are there. And you're like, oh my gosh, because this does happen when I give these surveys out. Um, and this is the one that I give from canine arthritis.org. It's like the, <laughs> the number one thing I will tell you to be full transparent, like I have, most parents are like, oh my God, am I a terrible pet mom? No, you're not. It's why you're here. It's why you're here. This is how we start the conversation. This is how we're gonna do it. And we're gonna get a plan in place together, okay? So no, you're not a terrible pet parent because animals get older. This is what happens. It's part of the circle of life, but it's not a disease and we're gonna keep them as comfortable and, and preserve and protect that glorious thing we call the human animal bond. It's just amazing. Okay, so there is that. So I think that's a great survey. I got to give a little plug for my book, you guys. So I don't know if you know this, but I did write a book. Um, I had a paralyzed ox and I have it here in my hand too. It's called Honey, Have You Squeezed the Docs? And you probably know why. My pet parents, when I'm on my TikTok lives, they don't know what that means, but my veterinary colleagues and uh, team members in here, you know why. And so I had a, um, a dachshund named Cosmo that presented to me at two years young. He was, um, you know, paraplegic and the, the pelvic hind legs, uh, T12, T13 and his owners couldn't care for him or afford his surgery. Unfortunately, they brought him in when it was too late. We did a fundraiser for him to get his back surgery done. He had the hemilaminectomy, no go, rehab, you name it, everything, acupuncture. Um, but 
he lived his life being paralyzed and I got a card from him, but I realized that intervertebral disc disease can be scary. And when I talk to my pet parents about this, it's beyond the 20, the 30, the 40 minute appointment. So I said, you know what? Let's write a book about it. And let's do really basic pet images. Like you see here that I have very digestible information that you see it's available on Amazon. It's only 1499. I'd be more than happy to autograph it for you, <laughs> but it's great pictures. And I got testimonies from pet owners around the country that basically my dog is paralyzed or some of them have done really well. I have great resources here on like other areas that you can go on to websites like dehumane.org, um, atlantahumane.org, um, talking about financial situations, um, like all these different things. So it's a really good book and it really inspired me. And Cosmo taught me to be a better human being and a better dog dad. I mean, we had a football player at Rutgers that got paralyzed um, from an injury. And I brought Cosmo in to inspire him to realize like, you're gonna be okay. Like, yes, what you've been through is terrible, but he's gone to hospitals. I mean, he's no longer, he passed away from nasal adenocarcinoma as if like he's had poor things been through enough, but he started, he lived his life as two. My friends, he lived till he was 14. And so, I had to express his bladder, hence the name of the book, you know, squeeze his bladder and not a single urinary tract infection, by the way, I'm so proud of myself because you would appreciate that. I know my friends would understand that. So, but squeeze his bladder. He lived a wonderful, glorious life and he stemmed my addiction for dachshunds. <laughs> Cosmo started it. So that's what I say. I blame Cosmo. So that's my book. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some integrated pain modalities. Comment in the chat box, my friends. Let's talk about it. Let's get to it. Talk to me about some things that you heard uh, that you like to implement in conjunction with, let's say, some of your typical and traditional, um, you know, let's all like regular medication modalities. So like the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. What else are you using in conjunction with that you think you need to use to address your acute and chronic pain? What are some things that you think work well? What are some things like, I don't know, I heard of this, but I just don't know. Um, you know, comment in the chat box, because as we go, let's see what you know. And then I also have a, um, an agree or disagree statement with you. I prefer a multimodal approach to pain management. Do you agree with that statement or do you disagree with that statement? Do you find that... Um, Pet parents are asking that more too. They're doing a lot of work on our friend, Dr. Google, and they're reading about certain modalities that you should be having in your clinic. And if you don't have this in your clinic, doc, then I'm gonna go to the next clinic that has this or that offers this recommendation. I wanna try some alternative medicine or integrative approach first before we go down like the non-steroidal or the traditional path that historically has been known, or we combine them together. Are we using Chinese herbs in addition to some laser therapies and other modalities, right? because it works, it works, my friends. Now I'm gonna show you one that works really well, okay? But so I already asked you, what are some modalities that you're looking for acute and chronic pain? And I'm gonna look at them because I see them all coming in. And I can't wait to read them um, when we're done here. But I wanna talk about one, I'm gonna put them on my, my head. I was just telling before I started that I suffer from migraines, really bad. I just had one today. And um, you know, I'm a huge fan of this. If you don't have, this loop, my friends, let me tell you something. You need to, because guess what? You know who's asking about it all the time? Your pet parents, your clients are asking about this. I was on my TikTok live. I was just doing my normal thing. I was just talking about heartworm prevention. And I had two pet parents that were talking about the Assisi loop and people had no idea. They thought they were like, what are you talking about? Like some people didn't know. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you know about this. So this is it, I have it in my hand. I don't know if you can see me, but I have this. So because I have dachshunds, so let's leave it at that and you'll see a picture of it. But this is, it decreases pain and inflammation, uh, accelerates healing in soft tissue and bone, and it decreases or eliminates the need for pharmaceuticals and op opioids. And it works well with other therapies. And I do wanna give a CC a shout out because your studies are solid, clean, concise, and you're nailing it. You are changing it, by the way. Doesn't it look like, I might be dating myself here, but doesn't it look like I belong in Romper Room? Do you remember that show? And I was like, when are they gonna call my name Adam? <laughs> Back in the day, you may not know this. So, cause some of you may not know Romper Room, but anyway, I digress, but I really do love this. So let's talk about it. 
So it uses targeted pulse electromagnetic field, okay? So TPEM therapy. So it's these devices like bone growth simulators have been available as FDA clear devices since the 1970s. So these things have been around, my friends. So they use the PEM signals that are tuned to target bones and increase healing in non-healing fractures. So a CC's patented tar targeted pulse electromagnetic field signals delivers a microcurrent to damaged tissue that is precisely tuned to trigger an animal's own natural anti-inflammatory process. So it has this electromagnetic signal, okay? So it's producing its own endogenous nitric oxide. And that's how it really works by upregulating the body's own ability to produce nitric oxide. And there's a lot, their website has great information about this too. And you can reach out to them for more information, but it's that biological effect of that induced current. And it's the, th that's a, a therapeutic component of the TPEM technology. So it enhances nitric oxide ability the body's own anti-inflammatory molecule. And I'm going to say that one more time, because again, I do think that this is another game changer that we use, that it's this body's own anti-inflammatory molecule. Okay. So that's pretty amazing. So uh, TPEMP has several waveforms used. So I click here, as you see right at the top, I don't know if you can see, look, I feel like I'm, I'm modeling lipstick. It's number 55. <laughs> but anyway, look, so see how it's blinking? So it's a session and like, for example, I feel it and I feel just a very mild pulse. So Chelsea, my um, 14, my 14, I just aged her, 12 year old dachshund, she has had a hemilaminectomy. So before bed, that's why I have it upstairs here. I have it on her back and I swear my friends, I know she feels good. It's like she tucks in her little booty in the back and she knows that and it makes her go right to sleep. Like I feel it a very mild pulse on me right now and it's on and um, I think it's fantastic. Is anybody gonna take a screenshot of this? Because this is pretty amazing, a CC. Let me tell you this. Wait, hold on, we're gonna do a screenshot. One, two, three. <laughs> I love to laugh, you guys. You gotta have fun at the same time. So yeah, a clinical trial that's using the TPEM therapy on dogs with spinal injuries resulted in reduced incisional pain, improved neuro um, protective qualities and a statistically greater degree of recovery on proprioception. So, so look at that beautiful wire hair dachshund deliciousness, uh, body conditions to have a four, by the way. And there's uh, the, the loop right around the area. So you can place it. Now they don't have to step through the loop too. And I don't have to get into the specifics, but you can reach out to your CC rip for more information, but you could press it on the arm. I've had um, several of my colleagues are using it in their post-op surgeries. I think it's brilliant. Your cystotomies, growth removals, spays, those kinds of things. So um, there's a lot of great methods to it. And I did want to give a shout out to that wonderful study that I'm obsessed with, by the way, because again, shout out to um, this study because it really is a game changer. Comment down below. Have you used a CC loop before? Have you heard of it before? I want to see your comments in the chat box too. So uh, get those thumbs rolling because I want to see if you're using it. Because if not, I'm going to put the CC loop on you. <laughs> oh, good. So I see some people answering. The other modality I want to talk to you about is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. My good friend, yours too, probably, Dr. Tim Crow, wonderful human being. I absolutely love him. He is a huge fan of the Assisi Loop and is a huge fan of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Now, again, this isn't something that you have, obviously, in your practice, but this might be something you have heard about and your pet parents might be asking you about as well. And so the results have shown this treatment is effective in curing inflammation, poisonous bites from snakes, arthritis and infected wounds, increase oxygen that helps the tissues and body aid in the healing process. So it's a really, they use this on the human side. So that's what you see this picture done. You, or you may know someone who uses hyperbaric oxygen therapy or hyperbaric chambers too for other modalities. There's so many different ways that it's used, but this in conjunction with maybe your traditional modalities that you're using, your non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, this is something to look into. Again, cost is an issue. Um, traveling, you know, maybe finding someone that's certified in this too, like physical therapy, um, pain management. But I always like to at least let you know, because again, I'm hearing this, the buzz from the pet parents uh, around the world and um, also in some of my um, conferences that I've been in. Okay, I wanna talk about Exubrion's uh, Sinovitin. So has anybody heard of Sinovitin? Comment down below, give me the number one if you've heard of this or you a uh, number two if you don't know what this is because um, you're probably seeing Dr. Dr. Uh, Matthew Brunke speak a lot about this as well as Dr. Kristen Kirkby Shaw talk a lot about this too. Dr. David Dykus is another one who talks a lot about this. So another game changer, my friends, a once a year um, elbow osteoarthritis pain treatment. Okay, once a year. Now I will tell you, like I don't speak for the company, so I can say this. <laughs> I can say this, that it's also not 
it's being used in conjunction with other areas in the elbow. The study, as you know, when you have to do a study, so expensive, especially for this, because this is classified as a medical device um, and it's radioactive isotope, but they know that it works in other joints. So the hips, the knees, okay? But on label right now, it's for the um, elbow osteoarthritis pain. So it's an intra-articular injection. So you have to be, they have to, do, the dogs have to be uh, mildly sedated for it, but it helps with the cycle of inflammation and pain. Okay, so let me just show you a little bit more about it. So it's, let's say I said, it's a microparticles of radionucleotide tin 117N. Okay, and so certain, these hospitals have to be um, approved by the state so not all the hospitals around the country have this. A few currently have it. More are in the pipeline of getting it. It's a process. It can be costly too, to obviously get your practice um, licensed to have this ability to have the radioactive isotope. I love this idea. I think this is a game changer again, especially if you think of your elbow height dysplasia dogs or you know those that have the OCD kind of issues. So you know it uses conversion electron therapy to target some of the macrophages and the synovioside injected into the joint. So durable pain, inflammation relief, restores active lifestyle, and it alters the course of chronic OA treatment. So maybe we don't have to keep them on uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories all year long. This is a one and done kind of an injection thing. So again, I don't, I'm not super, super aware, like no, no. So don't ask me like, how, what's the mechanism of action? But I, I have sat in multiple sessions on this. I have sat in meetings on this. And this is something that you're going to hear more of in 2022. Okay, so this is probably going to be more of your normal conversation is somebody might ask you about um, 117. It, can I look into Sinovetin from my dog, you know, so look into that. And um, that way you're aware. I think this is great. What do you think of this, by the way? Don't you don't you think this is cool? Like, this is another modality that we can add to our arsenal for multi um, modalities for pain. I mean, I, I mean, yes, I'm sure it's on the pricier side. But you know, for our sporting dogs too, or whatever, you know, doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be sporting dogs, but still, I just think that's just incredible that we have this availability to utilize in um, as a toolkit. Okay, shockwave therapy. Uh, have any of you been using shockwave therapy? I also like to throw in laser therapy on this too. So, you know, your class two laser therapies that are out there. Um, you know, I think this is something that could be used. Um, I want to back up and say one thing too. If you're not including it in your um, recovery packages, you should. So if you're doing it, let's just say for your spay, your um, post-op ACLs or uh, your CCLs, I always say ACLs, your CCLs, um, you know, it depends on whatever it is, include it in the pain package. So that way they're coming back, they're invested in it. They're, they're paying for the package of six sessions, let's just say as an example. So you know that they're gonna be more compliant to make sure that their fur babies are receiving the care that they deserve. And again, I'm gonna hone this in because it's the MBA in me as well. <laughs> I'm really big about this is that again, it's another service item that you can charge for. Okay. Another service item that you could charge for, whether you do house call services or you do, you're working in private practice. This is another way to help maintain revenue, but it's a great way too. And you're bonding with the clients. So, but anyway, this is shockwave therapy for dogs, positive results, improving bone healing, soft tissue damage, joint inflammation, OA, the list goes on and it's effectively treated with shockwave therapy include hip and elbow dysplasia and this is taken from the whole dog journal.com so shockwave therapy with arthritis uh, is what we see think of your chronic conditions chronic back pain for instance relief of muscle tissues i mean osteochondrosis semi so say that five times fast um, sesamoiditis that should be on wheel of fortune uh, tendon ligament injuries tendonitis fractures lick granulomas cruciate ligaments so and explain the why. And do me a favor too, my friends, do a video of this. Do a video of a dog that's getting a laser or a cat that's getting a laser. Show this on your social media. Show this on your website because people are going to want to share this and feel connected. They're going to feel invested in the story and they're going to want to bring their fur babies in. They're more likely to see you uh, more and more. Are you using acupuncture? Tell me in the chat box. Are you? Do you have somebody that does it? Are you interested in becoming an acupuncture an acupuncturist, or um, is there somebody in your practice that you refer it to, or whatever? Um, huge, huge fan of it. I swear, it's what I mean. I, I say this. I know on the call. Um, my good friend, Dr. Chris Shapley, is a veterinarian, board certified, and he's a, a acupuncturist. And I, my two dachshunds had hemilaminectomies, Connor and Chelsea, and he did acupuncture on them. I swear they did the zoomies. 
<laughs> after they got their acupuncture treatments. But think of all the other things, digestive health, chronic IBD, cancer, cervical pain, uh, bladder cancers. I mean, the list goes on with what you see. So it's not so much um, arthritis or musculoskeletal conditions. It could be GI disease, chronic issues that you're seeing. So we see such great results with um, acupuncture. And again, pet parents are asking about it. So in summary, let's just review. A lot of new tools to assist in identifying pain in our patients. Use them. Use them. Don't be afraid. Don't be that veterinary hospital that wants to see how other veterinary hospitals are going to be doing. Be the one that's going to make the change. We need you to help us advance the profession together. So we got to do this together. And, you know, the research is solid. These are CC loops. This, the research is there. It's solid, my friends. So start using it if you haven't done it already. Be innovative, use incredibly innovative modalities that are now available for both acute and chronic pain. We talked about the physical exam, use those tools too. Again, another great service item that you can charge appropriately for them too. But you know what, also we talk a lot about compassion fatigue in our profession too, that I, I find things in me, for me, I find these things help invigorate me as a veterinarian because these great tools are solid and amazing and it makes you do cool stuff. You don't get there sitting frustrating and saying, oh my gosh, this costs so much money. These things that I was talking about, aside from probably the Sinovet and, and the hyperbaric oxygen th therapy chambers are cost effective. They really are. Pain protocols with traditional and Eastern medicine are available. Use them, use Chinese herbs if you want to, look into the acupuncture. I mean, have a conversation with the pet parents, make them feel empowered. Like I say to them in the, in the exam room, I wanna keep you in the driver's seat because that's how it is now. When I first started practicing, I felt like the veterinarian, the, the pet parent is truly in the driver's seat. We are the wheels to help make and drive you to make those decisions possible. And we can only do this by doing it together is how we're gonna do it. And that's what I say in the exam room. So. Um, with that said, I also encourage you to always check out our publications. I'm so, so proud of them all, my friends. If you, if comment down below, are you subscribed to DVM360? Yes or no? And hey, are you coming to see me at Fetch? I'm going to be at all the live events. So we have Fetch um, Kansas City in August, at the end of August. We're going to be at Atlantic Coast Veterinary Conference too in Atlantic City in October 11th through the 14th. And then we're going to be in San Diego, December 2nd through the 6th. So I hope to see you all there. You can register at Fetch DVM 360. If you want a discount code, just reach out to me, but you got to follow me on Instagram and DM me and I'll give you a Fetch DVM 360 registration conference code, okay? So don't tell anybody, but I'll give you a special code. So, but DM me on Instagram. I'll show you my socials in a second. But if you're not, and then get the, the journal too, because it really is a great stuff. We're proud to have, um, uh, we're having our first annual awards, Veterinary Heroes Awards that's happening in December. So make sure you stay tuned because you can nominate a colleague, veterinarian, veterinary technician, practice manager, um, and we're having this wonderful gala that's going to be happening at Fetch San Diego. And I think it's so nice. We're having like the Oscars to veterinary medicine. What better time to celebrate us, right? Everything we've been through, everything we've been through. I can, I can cry because I love this profession. I was born in this profession. And I, I, I am so proud of this profession that we have overcome so much. And, you know, this human animal bond, we need these animals more than anything. So I, I can't begin to thank you all enough for what you're doing because you're so essential to it. And so here are my socials, by the way. I have my website, dradamchristman.com. Reach out to me, Adam Christman Show on Facebook, Adam underscore Christman on Instagram. Follow me, DM me if you want a code. And then if you want some great laughs and fun education too, I am on TikTok, Dr. Adam Christman 52. My YouTube channel is the Dr. Christman Show and I'm on LinkedIn, LinkedIn as well, Adam Christman. And on the left there is my-